Tiago Motta, the mastermind behind Bologna's unlikely push for a Champions League spot, is seen as one of the most impressive up-and-coming managers. With plenty of clubs looking for a new head coach this summer, could Motta be ready for a move to one of European football's elite? And how much does a new manager's style influence the roles that they're offered? I'm Adam Leventhal. Welcome to the Athletic FC podcast. Well, alongside me for this one is the Athletics Italian football writer, James Horncastle, and our data writer, Mark Carey, uh, who's written a profile on Tiago Motta, part of a series for The Athletic this week, profiling six up-and-coming managers, which I recommend everyone reads. Um, before we get to your perspective on Motta's impact on the pitch, Mark, James, I wanted to just get into your sort of knowledge of the man. You wrote a great uh, article with a wonderful intro um, regarding the Da Vinci Code, which I also <laughs> recommend uh, people read. Yeah. Uh, back in February 2023, it went on a mystical journey and I, I loved every minute of it. Um, but in terms of the the man, just a bit of a backstory on, on Motta to start off with his his journey and his his current impact at Bologna. Yeah, so Tiago in Italy has a, he's held in very high regard, not only for what he's doing as a coach at the moment with Bologna, but what he represented as a player. Because he came to Italy in his late 20s and it was really a kind of make or break move for him. You know, he he went to Genoa, played under Giampiero Gasparini. He had a great season. That year, Genoa finished fifth, but only on goal difference. Uh, they really should have qualified for the Champions League. Um, and that was kind of the first signs of, you know, sort of Giampiero Gasparini, the current Atlanta coach, and his impact on the league. And on the back of that, Thiago went to Inter with Diego Milito, his Genoa teammate, and they won the treble together. And I think when you assess the cultural moment, I suppose, in Italian football, there is a feeling that the competitiveness of, let's say, the Milan clubs at the highest level, there maybe was a watershed moment when it ended. And that was when Qatari money came into PSG and PSG essentially decided to become a fusion of Inter and Milan. You know, they signed Thiago Silva and Zlatan Ibrahimovic from Milan and they signed Thiago Motta uh, from Inter. And... I remember Claudio Ranieri, who was the kind of caretaker coach at Inter at the time, pleading with Thiago Motta to stay at Inter um, that January because he was so important to the team. He was a linchpin, a midfield player. He kind of is, I suppose, he's that archetypal player that um, I'm not going to say English ex-pros and pundits kind of pick on as being the slow, thoughtful midfield player who, you know, in their opinion, would never last in the Premier League and then comes back to haunt them whenever England play Italy in the European Championships. But, you know, he was he was a part of that Euro 2012 side um, that reached the final uh, and lost to Spain in, in, uh, in Ukraine and Poland. Uh, a magical midfield, really, of Andrea Pirlo of... Uh, Claudio Marchisio um, and Montolivo and then he was a part of Conte's Euros uh, side in 2016 as well so you know I think uh, his his successor if you like on the pitch you might say is, is someone like Jorginho you know again someone who polarises opinion in England and yet has been part of the Champions League winning side with Chelsea and has been pretty good for Arsenal when called upon by Mikel Arteta and so I think there was there was a feeling I mean you know, talking to some of his international teammates like uh, Gianluigi Buffon, you know, Buffon could never understand um, when Thiago got, you know, less than six and a half in the player ratings in the Gazetta, you know. He always thought this guy was a, a, an incredibly important player to how Italy played um, in that decade. And, you know, as we so often see, the, the trend of, of, of young managers tends to come, or tend to, not just young managers, but great managers comes from those who've played in between defence and attack, the guys in midfield, the guys who know how to do both phases. And and Thiago certainly is at that intersection. In terms of, of you know, now here at, at Bologna, um, for people who aren't aware, who don't have their eyes sort of tracked on, on Serie A, um, just how has he transformed 
them in, in, in short and then we'll get stuck into exactly what he's doing on the pitch, James? Well, it's been remarkable because, you know, Bologna over the last decade have always threatened to be a team that could break into the European places and they've never quite done it. And it's been the source of a lot of frustration within the fan base. This is a demanding fan base. You know, it's it's one of the most successful teams in Italy. People take for that for granted. You know, people who grew up in the Gazzetta Football Italia generation on Channel 4, they think of Parma as being, you know, one of the, the seven sisters. And, you know, Parma were one of the teams of the 90s and kind of benchmark as to the depth um, that a league has. But they never won the league. You know, Bologna have won it seven times. You know, like only Genoa, uh, Inter, Milan and Juventus have won it more than they have. And uh, and so th- there's always been this kind of yearning for for Bologna to to do big things, either in the cup or get into one of the second or third tier European competitions. And despite having a, an American, well, a North American owner, because Joey Saputo is kind of Canadian Italian, when he came in a decade or so ago, they thought that his investment would push them into these you know, European places. And Saputo, in fairness, has done some really interesting things. He's got all the sporting directors that a middling team needs to get in order to get into Europe. He's had Walter Sabatini, Pantaleo Corvino. At the moment, he's got Giovanni Sartori, but it hasn't happened. And and so I think that when judging Thiago's work, they're not just like at the moment in contention to get in the Conference League. They're in contention to get in the Champions League uh, and not just sneak in there either, but be comfortably in there if Serie A gets a fifth Champions League place in the expanded competition. So, yeah, in that respect, it's it's one of the more remarkable jobs that a coach has done in in, in recent years in Italy. So he's transformed them from City A strugglers to sitting fourth, Champions League chasing Bologna, um, and using ideas which have been sort of previously mocked and have been mocked along the way. Um, just take us into this these. And I, with inverted commas, wacky ideas. Because when I'm talking to a data man, you go, well, <laughs> these aren't wacky. These are just very sensible. But take us into them, Mark. Well, I think the initial idea that he was thought of as, as wacky was kind of incorrectly placed as, as such. And I think James mentioned it in the, the piece that he did last year. And I included it in, in the one that I did where he basically spoke about a 2 7 2 yeah. formation. And people thought that that was absolutely ludicrous which it would be if it was seen as something that's going from back to front. But he was very much focusing on left to right and talking about vertical 272. So very much focused on central progression, making sure that the the goalkeeper is part of their build-up and that um, he said about his attackers being very key to their defensive side of the game. So it was seen as wacky kind of, you know, as I say, erroneously. Um, But I think a lot of his, his principles and his philosophy starts and ends with the ball which is very much indicative of the, the modern day manager, but his his uh, UEFA Pro license thesis is called the value of the ball. And I know that a lot of football managers do want to, to have a lot of possession, but he really implements it sort of to, to the nth degree. And so looking at the numbers, um, they have the average 50% of, of possession in Serie A, which is the, the second highest, only Napoli have more, but they're very focused on this, this real deep buildup and making sure that they have really sort of clear, numerical superiority which is just a fancy way of saying having more players than the opposition in specific areas of the pitch where they really like to to work the ball through really carefully in a really considered manner we can speak about how that maybe affects the the attacking side of it maybe being a little bit blunt on the attacking side but they do something that's quite innovative but again fairly indicative of the the modern day game whereby they like to to bring their center backs into into midfield Sometimes one, which we've seen commonly with John Stones coming into midfield, um, you know, with Manchester City and uh, more and more uh, teams are doing it. I know Inter Milan are, are good at um, sort of progressing their centre backs forward. Sometimes both of them, and that's where it becomes interesting with Bologna because sometimes it will be just just the one at any one point to make more passing angles to work through the opposition's press. But sometimes it will be both at the same time, and that the fullbacks will tuck in. So, you know, watching Bologna sometimes you think. As, a, as an, someone who's just interested in football, you think, what are they doing? It's starting to make me panic a little bit, mm. but they have such a, a trust in each other. And another thing from, from Motta's thesis is that he talks a lot about technical trust of just essentially as what you want teammates to, to have is having that trust in your, in your teammate to take the ball, receive it in maybe difficult positions or uncomfortable positions. But then when you see Ricardo Calafiore running forward into being the, 
the man who's the, the, the furthest forward of any player, and then his centre back partner at the time, Sam Bukema, being the the, fit, the furthest man back, it just it looks quite jarring. But they they make it work, and it's as I say, key to to Motta's way of playing is to have that trust in each other, and wherever you see the space, expose it and try and work the ball forward. So he's big on on fluidity, but that's not a that's not a, a rare trait that we see in in teams anymore but I'm, I'm interested to to find out um whether that makes them very susceptible when it doesn't quite pan out mm. or is there a greater understanding you know out of possession as there is in possession yeah well I think that you know in tactic terms people talk a lot about rest defense of making sure that when you do have possession of the ball that you're well positioned and well placed to make sure that you you are comfortable to to defend, and I think that they do. The rotations do lend themselves to that to make sure that um, you know they they aren't really counterattacked on too much. Um, I think it, it feeds in, their possession play does feed into yeah, as I say, how potent they are in attack. They they're really strong defensively, and I think it's because they possess the ball so well in such a considered manner that they don't necessarily you know they aren't susceptible to the counterattack, but. They are almost so considered in their build-up that when they actually reach, and I'd be interested to get James' thoughts on this, but they they don't necessarily expose those transitional moments. They aren't super fast. They they will take the opportunity when it when it arises, but they aren't super fast in really looking to work the ball forward as quickly as possible. And I think it is because they are so keen on making sure that they have those those patterns in place and those rotations such that they can't. Um, yeah, they aren't susceptible to the counter-attack. So it, as with any tactical sort of uh, approach, it has its positives and its negatives. And the positives are that they are super strong defensively, one of the best in, in Serie A, if not across wider Europe. But they are maybe sometimes a little bit toothless in attack because they are you know, so considered in that possession style. Yeah, when you look at the very sort of simple uh, statistics, which is sort of more my wheelhouse than, than yours, Mark, <laughs> um, yeah, they don't score as many, 42 score, but they do have a great defensive record of just uh, 25 conceded, which is only bettered by uh, Inter and Juve currently in that top four. Um, James, what is what is the perception then of, of this side in Italy? Is he seen as a, a great disruptor or is he not everyone's cup of tea <laughs> well the context is Serie A and Serie A takes a lot of pride in producing the next big thing in coaching you know I think whenever people judge Italian football and Serie A and stars of play tempo usually comes to tempo right it's too slow it's where people like Thiago Motta go and have a second career after they've blown their knee out at Barcelona yeah the reality is, is that these coaches who are successful in Serie A go on and do translate their success in the Premier League, the league that everyone held in the highest regard. You know, I mean, the Premier League, if you look at winners of the Premier League, no nationality has had more winners of it than Italy. You know, Roberto Mancini, Carlo Ancelotti, Ponte, Claudio Ranieri, all coaches with different styles, all styles that have been transferable to, to Italy. And so... There is a great deal of pride in the coaching school at Coveciano. There is a great deal of pride in, I would say, this generation of young Italian managers that is coming coming through, not just Tiago Motta, but also people like Vincenzo Italiano at Fiorentina, Raffaele Palladino uh, at Monza. Uh, a lot of these guys are disciples of Giampiero Gasparini. Um, Gasparini, who uh, got Genoa up in 2007, playing with the back three, and yeah, that made the tr the back three popular again. You know, I think it it, it made people. Yeah, you know, there were stereotypes about it when he first came through. They would say, "Ah, oh, a back three is defensive. You're having an extra centre back." It proved that these people weren't really watching how Genoa played and how more often than not the strikers that were playing for Gasparini would be top of the goal scoring charts. People like Marco Barriello, Diego Milito. And you know, Tiago Motta talks in that thesis that Mark talks about, about two of the teams that have, well, not just two, there are four teams that, that have influenced him. I mean, there are two that he's played for. There was one that was the Jose Mourinho Inter Milan side that won the treble and how 
Mourinho, when it came to having a midfield player on the ball, the personality and the character that he wanted from a midfield player was, even if you're 3-0 up, to keep trying to play those vertical passes in behind for your strikers to score the fourth goal, the fifth goal, the sixth goal. Just keep going. Kill, kill, kill. Um, and then with Gasparini, which is, actually, you know, I don't want you to play the ball direct in behind and go direct to the striker. I want to, you to find a man between the lines and I want you to follow the play and get in the box yourself and score some goals. And the other thing, I mean, since he's uh, since he's become a coach, the teams that have influenced him in Marcelo Bielsa's Leeds United. Um, and, you know, you, Mark talked about that interview he gave in which he, he, he talked about, what was it, the 272 or whatever it is. Hmm. Um, and I think that's a reason why he looks at Bielsa and says, oh, Bielsa doesn't give interviews, so I'm not going to give interviews anymore. I'm not going to... Hmm. Talk to Gazette, Gazette de la Sport, so they make me look stupid like that time. So he doesn't give interviews uh, other than what he has to do sort of post-match and, and pre-match. And um, and so I think at, the, at this moment in time, you know, Bologna tried to extend his contract already last summer. Um, and, and I think they're still waiting for an answer. And so I, I think there is a feeling that yeah, Thiago was already interviewed for the Napoli job last year as a replacement to Luciano Spalletti. Um, it wasn't for him. Um, and, you know, I imagine that, you know, he will be at the top of lists for other top Italian clubs um, this summer. But he shouldn't just be top of that, those lists for Italian clubs. He should be taken in consideration by, you know, the likes of Barcelona, for example. You know, Barcelona, which is the team he moved to as a young kid from Brazil when he was a teenager. You know, his style of play is is, is very, in, in my opinion, fitting with with Barcelona. It was a surprise when Deco, their sporting director, basically said, I don't really follow Serie A, so I can't really comment on Thiago Motta. I think that was a, a dereliction of duty. And likewise with the Premier League, for the reasons that I outlined earlier, that, you know, Italian managers tend to be successful in the Premier League, regardless of what people think about styles of play in Italy. Um, they tend to be able to, to to transfer those skills ably. You know, even De Zerbi, De Zerbi hasn't won something with Brighton, but he's been the talk of the Premier League for the last eighteen months. So, uh, you know, in in that sense, there is a, there's a lot of pride in in basically producing another one of these guys. Mark, in terms of the the evolution that we've seen at at, at Bologna, um, has he has he changed things along the way? Has he has he evolved what he's needed to do to maybe be more pragmatic and maybe not stick to his his perceived sort of different ideas? Yeah, and I suppose it speaks to his his philosophy in general that it is about that that trust. And I think one thing that's spoken about quite widely is that idea of positional play and relational play of rather than having players in fixed positions like a, a Manchester City, a Pep Guardiola's Manchester City to ensure that you do really have that that structure. It's more about, you know, as, as James mentioned about sort of the Gasparini way of, of just following the, the ball and following the play in, in a relational sense, like I spoke before about the, the centre-back rotations, having different players who will pop up in in all sorts of positions. And Joshua Xerxes, as, as their their current number nine, will will drop very deep in a, in a false position and get involved within the build-up in different ways as well. So... I think as much as anything, that fluidity kind of on pitch speaks to that fluidity kind of between games and across a period of time because he wants to to trust his players, but with sort of broad principles. But I think the main thing, as I mentioned earlier, was the the evolution of their defensive play and having through possession of the ball, ensuring that you are really strong defensively. And that's something which within this piece that I wrote that, that came out this week is, yeah, that's probably the, the biggest evolution improvement through deeper build-up and making sure that you do possess the ball that they're uh, in the numbers that I that include within a, a graphic and a visualization in it is that their defensive metrics um, have improved quite significantly so yeah I think you can sort of look at it in terms of the uh, the changes in evolution in terms of outcome but in terms of process that fluidity that he instills by as James mentioned taking so many different influences from so many different managers that aren't all converging on the same style they, he is taking different aspects from different managers um, means that you almost can't pin him down which I think is is good and again to James's point the fact that then you think okay where could he move next and who would maybe suit his style it's really hard to, to answer that question because it's 
it's maybe sort of not answering the question as best you can, but it depends. Mm. It depends on what he wants to implement. It depends on the type of players that he has. It depends which uh, approach he wants to draw upon and draw from his own playing career to then apply that to, to the future. So it's, it's really exciting to see not only what his current style is, but then what his future style may be, depending on the, the team that he potentially goes to. It's always interesting, James, um, when a player becomes a manager, um, how their personality either changes or stays exactly the same. And you mentioned about the fact that maybe having his fingers burnt in some of the earlier interviews and having these interesting ideas, 272, et cetera, et cetera, uh, maybe that has made him more reticent to, to engage. But I wanted to find out what you know of him as a as a person, as a man, and what he is, what he's like as a as a as a person, is he is he cagey or is he very confident and and happy in himself? <laughs> I mean, he's he's serious. You know, I mean, like there have been moments where he could have, and he does enjoy the success that Bologna are having. I mean, they've got more points at this stage of the season than they did in the entirety of last season. They're 11 points better off than they are last year. They've got this shot. They're not just qualifying for Europe, but qualifying for the Champions League. And there's a great atmosphere at the Renato Dallada at the moment. Um, yeah, it's the place is selling out. The players go under the Kudva um, after the game. The fans often want him to go under the Kudva with them. Um, and he instead says, no, you know, the players have done the job on the pitch. They're the ones who deserve the praise. I'm going to stay here. And yeah, they've, they've, they've there have been times where he's looked a bit um, teary, you know, at seeing seeing the impact of of this team on on a city, um, which is a great, not just a great Italian city, it's a great football city. You know, it's it's, it's a brilliant place to go and watch football, great place to visit, um, and um, yeah, it's 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 very central uh, within Italy. You know, it's it's the kind of it's it's a very meaty part of Italy. You know, you know, think of. Uh, not just prosciutto, which is obviously in Parma, but you know every every bit of the pig. You know, you think of all those cuts of meat you get from Bologna, essentially. All the great music that you listen, to, a lot of the great music that you listen to from Italy comes from from Bologna. So there's a lot of things that are tied up in 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 the club, and and he's been able to relate relate to that in not in a deliberate way, in the way that, for example, his predecessor Sinis Mihailovic would. You know, Mihailovic would come to press conference with a quote from a biography, or well, a lyric from a song that's not really Tiago's style you know Tiago will will talk about his football he'll talk about the players um he'll talk about what they've done on the pitch um he's been quite um <laughs> how should I say this not frosty but like I remember I mean they could have had more points than they do at this stage this season because there have been some games where decisions have gone against them. For example, Juventus, um, I can't remember whether they got a penalty or they should have had a penalty, Bologna, um, and uh, a point at the Juventus Stadium should have been three points for Bologna. And he was asked about the referee decision and he didn't say anything, but um, his expression alone told you everything, if you know what I mean. He did, did it was there was no words necessary because you could completely feel from Thiago's like attitude and mentality, the face he was pulling, what his mood was. So, I mean, and I, and I think that's, that's, that's true of him, but his players seem to love as with De Zerbi, for example, his players seem to love playing for him. He's less charismatic um, than De Zerbi. De Zerbi is seen as this kind of high priest of a style of football and is, is uh, you know, whether he's, he likes it or not, he's at the kind of forefront of a bit of a culture war in Italy between the new school and the old school. Um, Tiago's not really in that, but all of his players, I think, relate to him in the same way that De Zerbi's do to him. They see they're improving. They see they understand the game better than they did before than when they, when, when they were coached by him. They feel that they've got more options on the ball than they did under his predecessors. They feel that they've got more freedom um, within the principles that Mark was, was was talking about. And I think that leads to a very happy group, a very together group, you know, that he's been able to include lots of players. You know, if you look at the the wingers of Bologna, they've constantly changed uh, this season from Orsolini, who, in my opinion, you know, 
people talk about Chiesa all the time. There have been many years where Rossellini's had better years than Chiesa. This is one of them. Um, there's uh, Endoy, who they signed from Basel. There's Salamakas, who won the league with, with AC Milan. Salamakas, who was crucial to kind of Milan's way of pressing. And I think the way, that's the other story about this Bologna side, is the way it's been recruited. Um, Mark was talking about rest defence, but this is a very athletic uh, Bologna team out of possession. Um, Lewis Ferguson, you know, is, is the stand-in captain um, and he's magnificent. Not only is kind of a shadow striker off Joshua Zerxe, but in terms of what he gives you when you need to win the ball back. You know, he's all over the pitch. Um, same with Remo Freuler. Freuler, who was at Forest briefly. Freuler, <laughs> for many years, was the Pac-Man in midfield for Gasparini's Atalanta. Um, so, uh, yeah, even players like Lukumi. Lukumi's rapid. Um, so they've they've got a, a caliber a, players with the attributes needed to to play this play this style and 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 learn and flourish in this style, which I think um, is is exciting. Just for people who aren't aware what a Pac-Man in midfield means, hmm. I love that phrase. <laughs> and if, I, if that's the first time I've heard it used, it might be commonly used, but I love it. Just ex <laughs> quickly explain what that what that is, James. Well, it's a video game from... But it shouldn't be the no, I know what Pac-Man is. I know what Pac-Man is, but what's a Pac-Man player? <laughs> he just gobbles up the ball. Just yeah, gobbles, good. It, gobbles it up. So, <laughs> good. Yeah. Chases it down, gobbles it up. Excellent. Um, just quickly... Uh, uh, from, from you, Mark, I saw you nodding furiously when yeah. James was mentioning some of the players that have been recruited in an interesting way into that side. Who gets your juices flowing in particular? Well, I mentioned Ricardo Calafiori yeah. before. He's a, a fantastic player. Again, I know that James thinks thinks highly of him and it, so many people do. And it, my understanding is that he is a converted left back. Um, he's so physically able, physically strong, um, now plays left centre back. Um, I think he's about six foot two, but in and out of possession, he's so so brave, so uh, aggressive. As I mentioned, he's the one who's sometimes you'll see him running from centre back and being the furthest man forward, but he will he'll follow the, the opposition um, uh, attacker or midfielder into central areas and really be really high up out of possession to make sure he's really touched tight. He's, I think that the main thing that, that Bologna do in general and Motta asks his centre-backs to do is be really brave on the ball and go into these areas in midfield that you wouldn't that you wouldn't otherwise feel comfortable going that doing um and California Fiori I think is the the representation of that he's he's really comfortable in sort of taking the onus and being the one to go into midfield and, and forming this sort of double pivot to make sure that that Bologna can build through the thirds um and in and out of possession I think that he is just so so strong and he's he's super young still in his early 20s um and I think that Without hyping him up too much, I think he is sort of worthy of a, a move to to potentially a, a bigger club because he's got all the physical attributes and all the technical and tactical attributes to um, to to go really far. And that's what people are talking about with with Tiago Motta, um, James, about moving to a a bigger club. Um, you've painted such a a beautiful romantic picture of the relationship between um, Motta and. And the, the the Bologna setup, the the city, um, but you've also spoken about the fact that yeah, he's he's got a contract offer on the table, but he's just sort of leaving it there for now. Thank you very much. How do you see this this panning out? If they are to get into the into the Champions League, does that completely change things? Does he think maybe similar to Xavi Alonso at Bayer Leverkusen? If I go and win the Bundesliga, maybe I'll stick around. <laughs> What's your thinking with with Thiago Motta and, and Bologna if they are then a Champions League team? Does it change everything and he sticks with them? Well, I think it depends on a couple of things. I think it depends if a decision's already been taken, whether he's already decided to go somewhere else. I think it depends whether, you know, on the flip side, you could say that reaching the Champions League would be an incentive for a, a coach to say, look, I've got unfinished business here. It'd be great to test myself and my group of players out at this level. Uh, by the same token, it might be the right time to leave. You could say this is the best opportunity for Bologna to go to other coaches and say, you get to take over a team and play Champions League football with this team. You'll have some revenue which will be able to plow into the team. So it's a good opportunity. I think this is going to be, in, in Italy, I think one of the indicators, well, one of the reasons why 
Italian teams have done quite well in Europe over over the last four years. You know, sort of last year reaching three consecutive finals, uh, three finals uh, in in UEFA competitions. Um, even before that, sort of into reaching a Europa League final as well in the Conte. Uh, I think it's because there's been continuity of managers. Yeah, Mourinho, for example, was at Roma for two and a half years, reached two European finals. Pioli's been at uh, Milan for a long time now, six years maybe. Gasparini's been at Atalanta for even longer. Um, Fiorentina's manager, who's got to sort of back to back, he's well, got to back to back European quarterfinals and reached the Conference League final last year. He's been in situ for this will be his third season. I think there'll be a lot of churn within Italy this year for the first time in a long time. Um, you know, we'll have to see whether De Rossi gets the permanent job at Roma. Napoli is a vacancy. They've got a caretaker job there, a uh, caretaker at the moment. Um, yeah, I think the only top club that are sure of their manager next season is Inter. Um, and so within the Italian ecosystem, you know, I, I think there is a lot of attention on, on Tiago Motta. And I always think uh, if you've got someone within your ecosystem, particularly within Italy, you're you're an, adva an advantage in ways to lure him away because you can say, look, here's some really talented young players. We'll throw them in. You give us the coach. You know, we, I mean, we've, we've seen it, for example, one of the success stories with Bologna this year has been a, a kid that they signed from Inter, Giovanni Fabian, a midfield player, who's built like a wardrobe um, and scores lots of goals. You know, Fabian basically joined because they were like, okay, Thiago's not been getting along with Marco Arnautovic, so why don't we send him your way and, and you give us Fabian? You know, there, there, there are lots of little trade pieces, if you like, that go in, that gives it gives Italians an advantage when it comes to keeping a coach or a player in their league. Um, but I, I think he's good enough. As I, we mentioned his heritage at Barcelona. I mean, I, I think he's he'd be perfect there. Yeah, he's very highly thought of at PSG. Um, from his, his playing time there, obviously started his coaching career in the youth system. Um, I don't think that job is going to is going to change, but it changes quite frequently. And I, th I think he will be a PSG coach uh, one day, without a doubt. But um, yeah, from, from my point of view, as someone who covers City and enjoys um, new stories developing City, I, I I would like to think he he would stay, um, if not at Bologna, then within the league. Mark, where do you see him potentially best fitting if it's not to be at Bologna? And we don't mm. want to, you know, talk someone out of a job and out of a, as I mentioned it's before, a romantic it's story. It's 70% of our content, uh, Adam. Yeah, Come I know, on. I know. I know. Sa <laughs> I'm saying we don't like it and then we do it. Um, but yeah, where would you see him sort of being more of a natural fit? You know, obviously James has mentioned about the the, the Barcelona links, the, the Paris Saint-Germain mm. links retained in Italy what's your sort of feeling on it yeah it's funny because this is so out of my own wheelhouse while it is 70 percent of what we do I normally focus on all the on pitch stuff so this is uh <laughs> come into yeah, our world I know yeah it's out of my comfort zone in that regard but I do think obviously James talks a lot of sense in terms of the the Barcelona um PSG connections not just because of his sort of playing days connections but because at the moment PSG are gearing more towards a uh, less sort of superstars and more sort of young talent and shaping that talent and Luis Enrique is comfortably within that position now but being so sort of possession based and being so dominant that could make a lot of sense and of course we don't have to talk about too much about the Barcelona style of play not least because yeah he was uh, sort of schooled within it but them being so focused on on possession as well which coming back full circle with his philosophy lends itself to that so so much so I think it would be a club if he were to move, be it a club that kind of is already geared towards a sort of a high possession system because, you know, people are talking about so many managers who are going to, we know are going to be leaving at the, the end of the season. But for example, Manchester United, people saying about Eric Ten Hag's position, I don't think that position or that or Motta's style of play would lend itself to overhauling the, the way that they play and, there's so much obsession about the Manchester United way and all that. I don't think that him trying to to evolve the style of play in that way would, would lend itself to that style of club. So I think it, whoever it would be, I think it would be someone who is already geared towards trying to to be really possession-based and trying to use that style to uh, to implement his tactical ideals. 
James, you mentioned a, a few moments ago um, subtly, and I didn't follow up on it then, but I'm going to follow up on it now, um, that in terms of where his next step might be in the fact that he hasn't necessarily um, accepted this, this new deal at Bologna, maybe a deal has already been done. If you were to tell us in your well-informed way where you think, especially if he's going to be retained in Italy, um, ah, he's sipping out of a Roma mug. Is that a clue or was that just a coincidence? No, um, no. I, tell hope, us, I, I mean, hope Daniele stays, the Rossi stays at Roma. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell me, you know, where, where do you think, where do you think it's going to go? I think uh, for now he he stays in Italy, um, and um, you know I mean, aside from his his time at the youth system with Paris Saint Germain, all of his coaching steps so far have been Italy. And you know, look, I mean that's that's not a limit on him because this is a guy who's who's very you know multicultural insofar as that yeah he's from Brazil. Um, naturalized Italian, speaks Portuguese, speaks Italian. Obviously, he spent the first part of his playing career playing in Spain. You know, the, the, this, this guy is adaptable. You know, even his style of football is very adaptable. Um, but I think, um, you know, as much as people think that, for example, Inter would be the only top club he would go, go to because people look at Inter and say that's where he played, that's where he's associated with the treble. Um, in Italy, I, I love how managers they they tend to they tend to look at their coaching careers differently. They 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 te they tend to not put limits on themselves. I always remember when Roberto Mancini, for example, was asked about uh, his his future, and he was like, and the, 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 I think a journalist said, "You'd never coach Roma, would you? Because you won the league with Lazio." And he was like, "Well, of course I'd coach Roma." <laughs> you know? hmm. <laughs> because why why would I limit myself to this kind of provincial kind of mentality of of, of city rivalries? You know, if there's a good a good team at Roma, good offer, good prospects, of course I'd go there. <laughs> and so I think you know if 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 you know if 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 uh, if, if a Juventus or a Milan job were to come available, I think he would be he would be considered without without a doubt. And um, I think you know both of those projects um, you know wed quite well. With with what Thiago's shown in terms of his ability to nurture young players and be competitive doing so, you know, I think I wrote last week did quite an in depth thing with Juventus about their next gen team um, and how well Allegri has done. And I, I think Allegri doesn't get I, I think Allegri doesn't get enough credit for the amount of young players he's bred um, through in, in in the last year. Um, but you know, I think teams that particularly in Italy. You know, Italy does not have the financial might to compete with the Premier League or the state wealth clubs. Italy had a tax break for four years, which allowed them to sign players like Christian Pulisic, like Ruben Loftus-Cheek, Tomori. That tax break is gone. Italian clubs are going to have to get real about developing from within, developing young players. And I think that's something that Thiago has done very well. So I think that, 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 that Bologna, so I think the top clubs in Italy will have an eye on him because of that because of the the context in which Italian football is right now. And so um, so I think that's another reason why if I'm a top Italian club, I would be pushing to get Tiago Marta. And just a word on, on the only Italian who is currently in the Premier League, and he's been mentioned a couple of times already, Roberto De Zerbi. Um, we may well end up with another one with Enzo Maresca getting up with, with Leicester, but they're having a bit of a, a wobble at the moment. Um, in terms of his best next step, and, you know, Brighton are used to people, you know, <laughs> selling their players and selling, you know, potentially selling their, their managers. Um, where do you think his star is at the moment in this second season post getting into Europe? Well, I think perhaps the Roma games in, in, the, uh, in Europe were... Perhaps a turning point, I think, in, in, in as much as, you know, when Brighton lose, they lose heavily. And I think that's not something that's acceptable at top clubs. And okay, he would have different personnel at top clubs. So maybe this style of play is can be more consistent um, with, with better players. Um, but also he, 
you know, he called out ownership and the direction of the club after that that Roma game, uh, after the first leg. And I think that's not something that, I think that's something that top clubs are always looking at. Okay, is the manager going to um, keep counsel? And if he's got constructive criticism, just keep it with behind closed doors and tell us, or is he going to go public with it? And obviously, yeah, the, the extreme of that is Antonio Conte. Uh, I think it's the year anniversary of his inventing at Tottenham. I think Jack Pitbrook recently wrote about that. So I think that's something that's always on on people's minds when you know they maybe link Deserbi with the Liverpool job. Would would that be acceptable to Liverpool? Would that be acceptable to, to Manchester United? Deserbi also said, yeah, one day he does see himself being back in Italy. But I think he's too expensive at the moment, and that's not Roberto's fault. Um, that's that <laughs> that's the fault of him working and succeeding, relatively speaking, in, a, in an economic environment where you know even a, a, a coach in, in the for, for a club that is not a Manchester United, Liverpool, or Tottenham is is capable of commanding a salary which is so much higher than even the top clubs in Italy can afford to pay. And it's even more difficult now that the tax break is gone, that they can, they no longer have something to soften, for example, um, being able to to pay a wage which approximates what someone like Roberto would get um, in in the Premier League. The, the other thing that I've always thought would be Roberto is, is he's, he's a perfect, ma- he's a perfect Barcelona manager in waiting. Yeah. And I would love to see an Italian teaching these Catalans how to play football. I'd love it. It'd be brilliant. <laughs> Um, so, you know, as much as we've talked about Thiago um, being a, a p- perspective or should be on there on, on, a, on a short list for a club like Barcelona, I think Roberto um, should be as well. I mean, he's when he was at Sassuolo, he's either signed players from Barcelona or he sold players to Barcelona because Barcelona have seen what this guy does with with, with players and how he he transforms them. So, it wouldn't it, it wouldn't surprise me to see him go to Spain first rather than go back to Italy if 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 if, if you know what I mean um so um so yeah he's he's continually fat- fascinating uh Roberto and uh, long may continue big thanks to James as always and to Mark as well here in the studio and just to let you know the best up and coming managers series is currently running on The Athletic uh, you can read Mark on Tiago Motta also Nancy Froston on uh, Kieran McKenna who's going great guns at Ipswich at the moment then still to come this week we have profiles of Paolo Fonseca Will Still Michelle and Garcia Pimienta as well um, don't forget to rate and review the podcast as always that would be much appreciated thanks very much for listening we'll be back tomorrow <laughs>